It's a real privilege to be part of this project for the past nine months now. It's something that's come out of a lot of years of work, of working with children, and seeing where the problems have been, as many problems in how you manage childhood epilepsy, including diagnosis, but also communication. Some background information first for those of you who may not have too much understanding or knowledge about the epilepsies of childhood. And really these days we're talking about the epilepsies of childhood. There isn't one thing or one condition called epilepsy, it's the epilepsies. And probably one in 240 children under 16 years of age will have active epilepsy, which means epilepsy requiring medication. So approximately that's 60,000 children under 16 in the UK have active epilepsy. It's the most common chronic neurological condition in children we come across in the UK. It's a very heterogeneous group of syndromes and disorders, ranging from very simple to control epilepsies with no additional problems through to epilepsies where seizure control is never achieved with usual multiple comorbid problems. One in three children with epilepsy will have additional and often complex comorbidities, educational, physical, cerebral palsy, psychosocial, autism, and mental health disorder. One in three children will have uncontrolled seizures. Now again, depending on the syndrome, maybe all will be controlled or none will be controlled, but as a group, all epilepsies, one in three children will have uncontrolled seizures, will never achieve seizure freedom for more than a few weeks and never will achieve a one-year seizure-free period. And one-year seizure freedom is important for many things you do as a teenager and adult. One in three will attend an emergency department at some point because of their epilepsy. Either prolonged seizures, status epilepticus, or side effects of medication, or other reasons but to do with their seizures. And epilepsy has a significant impact on their life and the quality of life, but also that of their parents and their families. And often, until recently, I think siblings in these families have been largely forgotten because the siblings of children with epilepsy often get a short straw. And this has a really negative impact, especially if the epilepsy is poorly controlled, frequent hospital admissions, frequent attendances in outpatients. It will impact on the quality of life of these families. And finally, not because it's least, but because I think it should be at the end, there is an increased mortality rate in children with epilepsy, particularly those with a complex epilepsy different to control seizures, particularly tonic-clonic seizures, and seizures at night. That's just some background information about the epilepsies. I could be here for the next hour and a half. It's a really passionate subject of mine, <laughs> as my colleagues know. And in 25 years as a consultant, I've really learned so much about epilepsy as a childhood, but I'm still learning day by day. Now, in 2013, I was part of a group Peter Sidebottom was a paediatrician who chaired this group, and we did an audit in the UK amongst all paediatricians, and it was published, Child Health Reviews UK. It's part of their Clinical Outcome Review Programme, and this is looking at epilepsy care and focusing on two particular populations of the epilepsies. One was those children with epilepsy who died, and the second population were those who had prolonged seizures who required attendance in emergency departments or admission. And some of those would actually then go on to die. It was an eight or nine month audit, producing some extremely valuable information. Some of which was surprising, some of which unfortunately was not surprising at all. And one of the non-surprising parts or messages coming out of this report was communication. And for the first time, the group felt that the term epilepsy passport lent itself to this specific problem with communication. Communication between what happens in the home, the child's school, the ambulance service, that's a big area to think about. And we're also involved with some national work currently, which is coming to fruition at the end of this year. And then the hospital. And we looked at the standard of care that children received in the home community and schools, 
the ambulance service and paramedic teams and the hospitals. And there was a constant theme that continuity of care was often not there between the home and the hospital. The problem was in the middle with the ambulance service. But on top of that, there was communication. Very poor communication, at times non-existent communication, even with children with a complex epilepsy. You won't read this on the back, but I'll help you through it. We produced a set of key findings and recommendations from this audit. This review has highlighted the importance of clear and comprehensive care plans for parents, schools, and others caring for children with epilepsies. Provide them information on how to respond to prolonged seizures, including training in resuscitation and the use of rescue medication. This is important for all children with epilepsies, but particularly where the child is known to have suffered or be at high risk of prolonged seizures. And such care plans could be included in an epilepsy passport. And this term, the passport, came as a recurrent theme or least motif throughout the whole report. And the recommendation, this finding supports the recommendations of emergency care plans as set out in the NICE and SIGN guidelines. So we recognised quite early on that there was a deficiency of rescue care plans for these children, and not just children with complex epilepsies, but also the straightforward simple epilepsies. Why do we need a passport? We felt it would help communication between the child and the family, the paramedic service and the hospital services, emergency departments, but within the wards as well. The clinical team looking after children and young people with epilepsies should consider introducing an epilepsy passport for all children as a means of improving communication and clarity around ongoing management. You've seen this slide before, but the highlight this time is the importance of clear and comprehensive care plans. Now, in the NICE guidance, it said that every child and every individual must have a comprehensive care plan. People ask me, what on earth is a comprehensive care plan? And Epilepsy Action produces a very useful one that you can download from the website, but it is quite comprehensive, which means it's quite long, which means it's quite unwieldy and practically not of much use on a day-by-day -day basis. What we've introduced, you take up the really core key skeleton of the epilepsy information on these children, what you really need to know, and that is what we think is the crucial comprehensive care plan. So it doesn't reproduce or replace the more definitive comprehensive care plans, lifestyle issues, school-related activities, which are important, but it focuses on when a child pitches up in emergency department, or is seen with the ambulance service, or is on holiday abroad, what key information does that person need to pass on to the people looking after the child? I won't go through this because it's too small to read, but the bottom line was, these are the things that came out of the review which led us to think that one way forward, we wouldn't be so naive to think this would completely produce fantastic communication across the board, but it would certainly improve what we currently do, is an up-to-date care of the child's epilepsy and the medication they take on a regular basis. The care plan and the rescue plan must be included in any passport because children will turn up at some point. One in three will turn up emergency department requiring emergency care and support. There has to be something in there to say what that child should receive or not receive in the case of a prolonged seizure. Because don't forget, sometimes the medication we use can actually cause adverse side effects and might cause more problems than actually we're hoping it's going to do. There must be greater participation with the children and the families in how they manage their epilepsy. Easy to say, but quite hard to do. And this really helps because you'll hear from Amit in a minute, when we created and when we make the first passport and clinic, it is a conjoint team approach, teamwork between the family and the child and the clinician to put in information that's relevant for that child. It would improve coordination of care and clarity around emergency management. 
It facilitates good documentation and management, including the emergency care plan for that particular child. It ensures that all those looking after the child are informed and up to date. And this is important not just for health professionals, but also for educationalists and schools. And unfortunately, it's often the case in schools that they're ignorant of a child's epilepsy, ignorant of what to do if the child has a seizure, and out of ignorance comes fear. And fear produces stigma, and it drives down the problem we have with trying to get epilepsy out in the open. Compared to when I started 25 years at Alder Hay, we've come a huge distance, fantastic distance. But there's still more to do, and this, I'm convinced, will help to do that. It'll also help to educate the paediatricians managing the children with epilepsy because they will be forced, I hate to use the word forced, they'll be encouraged <laughs> to put into the passport what sort of epilepsy that the, the patient has, the seizure type, the syndrome, and the cause. And we have to keep on educating paediatricians about epilepsy in children. Again, 25 years ago, it was really, really poor. We've come a long way in a quarter of a century, but there's always more so we can always do better. And I think this will be developed as a standard of care. Some of you might have heard of the nice quality standard statements on epilepsy. I was part of the group that actually wrote those statements. There were nine for children. And one of them, which is fantastic, is that every child with epilepsy must be seen by, referred to, and involved with a nurse specialist in epilepsy. Fantastic. Fantastic. I hope for the next time NICE review the quality standard statements and NICE review the whole guide on epilepsy, there will be, number 10, every child with epilepsy will have, must have, the epilepsy passport. That's a vision. It's a vision we're going to see. 25 years ago, I set up the first nurse specialist post on epilepsy in the UK. I started the first transition clinic between children and adult services in the UK. This is my third and final attempt, <laughs> and I will see it through. <laughs>